Welcome Dostoevsky lovers. My name is Patrick Bergman, and I'm thrilled to guide you through this journey into the depths of the Brothers Karamazov. This course is designed for those of you who have ventured through the complex world of the Karamazov family more than once and are now ready to dive even deeper into its intricate layers. We're going to explore nuances and elements that might not be apparent at first glance, making this an advanced course tailored for seasoned readers of the novel. All chapters of this course are structured around the chapters in the insightful work of Robert L. Belknap in The Structure of the Brothers Karamazov, originally published in 1967. Belknap's analysis will serve as our compass as we navigate the vast intellectual and emotional landscape crafted by Dostoevsky, ensuring a comprehensive and enlightening exploration of this literary masterpiece. Now over to the introduction of Belknap's book. Few novels in history have provoked such diverse and intense reactions as Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. Since its publication during 1879 to 1880, readers have been perplexed, transformed, and forever marked by the experience of delving into its philosophical depths. From those who view it as an ode to Satanism, to those who see it as an affirmation of divine order, Interpretations of the Brothers Karamazov span the extremes of human imagination. Such myriad impressions attest to the novel's profound complexity and its unparalleled ability to evoke personal, visceral responses in audiences across time and culture. In the face of such bewildering diversity, how can we begin to grasp the essence of Dostoevsky's masterwork? Literary scholar Robert L. Belknap provides a compelling answer urging us to go beyond individual projections to examine what Dostoevsky expressed and how he expressed it technically in the text. Through meticulous analysis grounded in factual evidence, Belknap illuminates the ingenious narrative techniques Dostoevsky employed to shape reader experiences, ranging from the diabolic to the sublimely spiritual. From the gripping use of juxtaposition to the recession into clarity via multiple viewpoints, Belknap reveals the method behind the magic of the brothers Karamazov. By unlocking the technical brilliance underlying Dostoevsky's creation, Belknap helps us appreciate both the novel's profound impacts and the artistic mastery of its creator. Join us as we explore the depths of the brothers Karamazov guided by fascinating insights into Dostoevsky's narrative artistry. Far more than a work of fiction, this novel beckons us to confront the eternal mysteries of human existence. Let's transition to the second part of Belknap's book, which delves into the structure of inherent relationships. Following this exploration, we will navigate through the sequential structure via the plot, culminating in an examination of the narrative structure. For the moment, however, our focus will be on unraveling the intricate web of relationships that enriches this magnificent novel. In the first chapter of part two, we discover the hidden connections in the brothers Karamazov that make Dostoevsky's novel a masterpiece of complexity and depth. Robert Belknap, in Some Properties of the Inherent Relationships, unveils how Dostoevsky intricately designs the novel's elements, likening them to the systems of the human body. From the skeleton to the musculature, each system cannot function alone, yet each can be dissected for deeper study. Belknap identifies four structures within the novel, inherent, historical, sequential, and narrative, with a particular focus on the inherent structure. This framework delves into the pre-existing themes and relationships, like the groundwork of Dostoevsky's mind before the novel takes shape in time and space. Through examples like Grushenka's feline qualities and the inexplicable link between Maximov and von Sohn, Belknap demonstrates how Dostoevsky forges connections by fiat, creating associations that deepen the narrative's layers. Take the enigmatic parallel between Alyosha and his mother, sparked by Fedor Pavlovich's observation, and the mirror of departures between Ivan, Dmitri, and Alyosha. These moments, masterfully crafted by Dostoevsky and highlighted by Belknap, reveal the novel's inherent structure, a rich tapestry of relationships that beckon readers to look beyond the surface. Join us as we explore how Dostoevsky's novel, guided by Belknap's insightful analysis, becomes a symphony of interconnected themes and relationships.
This journey through The Brothers Karamazov is a deep dive into the art of narrative construction, inviting readers to discover the profound intricacies hidden within one of literature's most celebrated works. In our exploration of The Brothers Karamazov, I've taken it upon myself to introduce examples beyond those discussed by Belknap, aiming to further illuminate the concepts he highlights. In Chapter 1, some properties of the inherent relationships, I believe a scene towards the end of Book 2, serves as a clear illustration of the inherent relationships Dostoevsky embeds within the text. Come on, jump in, friend, hurry. Let him in, Vanya, my son. We'll have great fun with him, and in the meantime, he can lie somewhere between our feet. Or shall we put him on the box with the coachman? Jump up on the box, von Sorn. But Ivan, who had silently taken his seat, suddenly swung around, put his hands on Maximov's chest, and shoved him so violently that he landed a good three yards away, only by miracle remaining on his feet. Drive on! Ivan shouted angrily to the coachman. Why did you do that, Vanya? What's come over you? Karamazov protested, but Ivan didn't answer. This scene, while initially seeming like a simple act of aggression, invites us to ponder the underlying reasons for Ivan's behaviour, whether it stems from societal class tensions, personal grievances, or deeper philosophical disagreements, further showcasing the novel's intricate exploration of inherent relationships. It is a small scene in the book, but it hides so much more and encapsulates the wider existential and ethical inquiries that define the novel. In The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky constructs the concept of Karamazovism, a composite of traits defining the novel's central family. This notion, deeply explored by Robert Belknap, encapsulates the intricate dance between vileness, lechery, a unique form of simplicity bordering on the prophetic, and an undying zest for life. These elements coalesce to paint a vivid picture of a family embroiled in a complex moral and existential struggle. Karamazovism is first and foremost a portrayal of moral and ethical ambiguity. The Karamazov brothers, Dmitri and Ivan, along with their father, Fyodor, exhibit a shared propensity for scoundrel-like behavior, intertwined with moments of profound existential questioning. Dmitri's self-identification as a scoundrel echoed in the accusations thrown at him by others, mirrors Ivan's own grappling with his moral compass, particularly in his abandonment of familial loyalties for personal gain. This shared vileness becomes a core attribute of Karamazovism, highlighting the family's internal and external conflicts. Moreover, lechery, another pillar of Karamazovism, extends beyond mere physical desire to encompass a deeper, more destructive force. And the concept of half-wittedness in Karamazovism diverges from traditional notions of foolishness. Instead, it represents a kind of spiritual innocence or simplicity, particularly embodied by Alyosha, whose purity and empathetic nature contrasts sharply with his family's darker inclinations. This simplicity, however, does not shield him from the familial curse, but instead deepens his connection to the central themes of faith, sacrifice and redemption that pervade the novel. At the heart of Karamazovism lies an insatiable thirst for life, a trait that binds the Karamazovs in their most desperate moments. Ivan's declaration of his will to live, despite his disillusionment with the world, captures the paradoxical desire to find beauty and meaning in a seemingly chaotic existence. This longing for life, coupled with the inevitability of suffering and moral decay, forms the crux of Karamazovism offering a window into Dostoevsky's exploration of the human condition. For the discussion on Karamazovism and its embodiment in actions within society rather than withdrawal from it, this passage from Zosima's advice to Alyosha is particularly resonant. There's no peace there, so you help them out, be really useful to them. And if the devil stirs them up again, say a prayer. And you know, son, the elder liked to call him that, the monastery is really no place for you. Remember that, my boy. When God decides the time has come for me to die, you must leave the monastery. Leave it for good. Alyosha gasped. What's the matter? 
No, this isn't the place for you, at least not yet. I am sending you out into the world with my blessings, and you will be of great service there. There's still a long, long road ahead of you, and you'll take a wife too. This passage highlights Zosima's recognition of Alyosha's potential to engage with the world's complexities and contribute actively, reflecting the paradoxical Karamazovian thirst for life that Belknap outlines. It shows how spiritual change intersects with outward action, rather than isolation. Zosima sees that the monastery cannot contain the multitudes Alyosha encapsulates, the sensuality, passion and vibrancy that form the core of Karamazovism. This exemplifies how personal transformation through grace enables wider societal contribution in Dostoevsky's moral framework. In examining Karamazovism, Belknap anticipates two primary objections. First, the traits that comprise Karamazovism are not neatly apportioned among the characters. For instance, lechery manifests not just in the brothers but in figures like Grushenka and Maximov. Moreover, characters beyond the Karamazov family, like Rakitin and Ilyusha, are labelled scoundrels. Even Lise confesses her own vileness, complicating the exclusivity of Karamazovism. This diffusion reflects the novel's resistance to allegory, where attributes are monopolised by emblematic figures. Instead, each character displays varying degrees of the Karamazovian traits, as Alyosha describes through the metaphor of a ladder of sensuality, this hierarchy fluctuates dynamically. The genre necessitates overflow between figures, with the Karamazovs' central but not definitive embodiments. The second objection concerns the paradoxical inclusiveness of Karamazovism. Suicidal tendencies seem the antithesis of the love of life the concept encompasses. Yet as the prosecutor argues, this coexistence of opposites is intrinsic to the Karamazovian psyche, evident in the figures of Dmitri Ivan and Smerdyakov. Pride counters vileness, intellect lechery, and revolt half-witted naivete, elucidating Dostoevsky's theme of inclusiveness. Through these observations, Belknap reveals how Karamazovism transcends discrete attributes to become an embodied force influencing the novel's world. Associations and fiats by the narrator further its phantasmagoric presence. For devotees of Dostoevsky's artistry, Belknap's meticulous structural analysis provides invaluable insight into how the author weaves a grand psychological tapestry through resonance and paradox. As my example of the character's embodiments of the complex, often contradictory facets of human nature, the following excerpt from Book One, Chapter One, is illustrative. Fyodor Karamazov, for instance, started with next to nothing. He was just about the lowliest landowner among us, a man who would dash off to dine at other people's tables whenever he was given a chance and who sponged off people as much as he could. Yet at his death, they found that he had a hundred thousand rubles in hard cash. And with all that, throughout his life he remained one of the most muddle-headed eccentrics in our entire district. This passage illuminates the complex nature of Fyodor Pavlovich, merging his apparent muddle-headedness with a shrewd capacity for wealth accumulation. It underscores an often overlooked dimension of Karamazovism, the practical and cunning intelligence that thrives alongside more explored philosophical and existential themes. Here, Dostoevsky showcases how traits like opportunism and survival instinct contribute richly to the Karamazov identity, suggesting that their legacy is not only defined by high moral and intellectual pursuits, but also by a grounded, if morally ambiguous, practicality. In the chapter The Devil, Belknap ventures deep into the entwined complexity of Dostoevsky's portrayal of evil emphasizing the multifaceted nature of the devil as both an allegorical and overflowing presence in the brothers Karamazov. This embodiment of evil extends beyond a singular figure, touching on characters like the Grand Inquisitor, Smerdyakov and Ivan, weaving a dense tapestry of associations that define the novel's moral and existential battleground. Belknap identifies the devil's presence as a force of self-annihilation and non-being, a theme that resonates deeply with the Karamazov family's own self-destructive tendencies. 
the devil's influence is intricately linked with deceit embodied in fedor karamazov's proclamation of being a lie and the father of lies reflecting a broader narrative preoccupation with the nature of falsehood and its implications for the human soul furthermore the desire for total destruction exemplified by lisa's wish to burn a house down showcases a profound form of cruelty that aligns with the devil's spirit of non-being this cruelty particularly towards children becomes a recurring motif with belknap drawing connections between this malevolence and various characters actions and desires thus amplifying the novel's exploration of human capacity for evil belknap's analysis extends to the social and ideological realms identifying the devil with atheism socialism and a rejection of divine order epitomized by the tower of babel this confluence of atheism and socialism coupled with a critique of french influence situates the devil within the broader socio-political context that dostoevsky interrogates throughout the novel by weaving together these threads of self-annihilation deceit cruelty and ideological rebellion belknap illuminates the devil's central role in the narrative's moral and existential questions the devil as both a personal and societal force embodies the complex interplay of individual desires moral failings and the search for meaning within the karamazov family and the wider community belknap's analysis not only highlights dostoevsky's mastery in portraying the multifaceted nature of evil but also underscores the novel's enduring relevance in grappling with the darkness inherent in the human condition in exploring the subtle manifestations of the devil's influence in the brothers karamazov a passage from book seventh chapter three the onion subtly captures this pervasive theme in this scene grushenka's transaction with rakitin reveals the complex interplay of manipulation betrayal and moral compromise that dostoevsky intricately weaves throughout the novel listen alyosha i was so eager to get you here all to myself that i promised rakitin 25 rubles if he would bring you to me well rakitin here it is grushenka walked quickly over to her desk opened a drawer took out a purse fished out a 25 rouble bill and handed it to Rakitin. What's that? What's going on here? I don't understand, Rakitin cried out, not knowing what to do. Take it, Rakitin. I'm sure you won't refuse to collect a debt, she said, and threw him the bill. I wouldn't think of refusing it, not for one moment, Rakitin said in a hoarse voice. Although he tried to hide it, he was obviously embarrassed. I can certainly use the money. Besides, why shouldn't a clever man take advantage of the stupidity of others? This excerpt not only highlights Rakitin's role as a schemer and opportunist, willing to exploit Alyosha for monetary gain, but also echoes the betrayal narrative akin to Judas Iscariot's betrayal of Jesus. Rakitin's justification of his actions underlines a broader theme of the devil's work in the novel, the exploitation of trust and the moral corruption that arises from selfish desires. This scenario provides an insightful reflection on human nature, illustrating how the devil's elusive presence can manifest in the moral choices and justifications of individuals, echoing the complex, multifaceted depiction of evil that permeates Dostoevsky's narrative. Through Robert Belknap's insightful analysis in the chapter The Buffoon, we're introduced to the significant roles played by characters such as Fyodor Karamazov and Maximov, who embody the essence of buffoonery in the novel. This motif is not merely a source of comic relief, but serves as a mirror reflecting the existential turmoil and societal critique at the heart of Dostoevsky's masterpiece. Fyodor Karamazov, the patriarch of the troubled Karamazov family, is perhaps the quintessential buffoon of the narrative. His life is a series of irrational acts, driven by a state of mind that disregards social norms and logical reasoning. His absurd stories and eccentric behavior serve as a mechanism to challenge the status quo, pushing the boundaries of acceptable conduct and societal expectations. Similarly, Maximov, a character attracted to Fyodor for reasons not entirely understood, shares this buffoonish demeanor. His slapstick encounters and the series of anecdotes he recounts ranging from whimsical tales of Polish girls to his own bizarre marital experiences, underscore the buffoonery motif. Belknap delves deeper into the concept of buffoonery, 
by likening it to a stream of consciousness, a narrative technique that allows for an unfiltered flow of thoughts and emotions. This method of storytelling provides insight into the character's inner worlds, revealing their fears, desires, and insecurities. The buffoon's blathering is not aimless chatter, but a reflection of a deeply ingrained sense of shame and a desperate need for self-expression. It's a tragic irony that the buffoon, often dismissed as mere comic relief, harbors profound insights into the human condition. So when we laugh at them, we are laughing at ourselves. The chapter further explores the social and existential dimensions of buffoonery, drawing parallels between the buffoon's rejection of societal norms and Ivan Karamazov's metaphysical rebellion against God's world. Just as the buffoon creates his own reality filled with absurdities and contradictions, Ivan's philosophical inquiries challenge the foundational truths of existence, both questioning the very fabric of moral and ethical order. In exploring the theme of inadvertent buffoonery in the brothers Karamazov, particularly how others' perceptions can cast a character in the role of a buffoon, this passage offers an illustrative example. For the last time, Mr. Karamazov, Miusov warned him again hurriedly in a threatening whisper, remember your promise to behave or I'll make you pay for it. I really cannot see why you should be so excited, Karamazov replied sarcastically, unless you're worrying about your sins at last. Why they say he can tell just by a man's eyes what's troubling him. And anyway, why should the opinion of these people be so important to you? a Parisian and an enlightened gentleman. You really amaze me. This exchange between Miusov and Karamazov highlights the unintentional buffoonery Miusov embodies, not through his own actions, but through the dismissive and sarcastic treatment by others, including Karamazov. Despite his self-perception as a superior and enlightened individual, Miusov's concerns and threats are trivialized, showcasing how the novel's characters often find themselves subjected to ridicule or diminished significance, irrespective of their self-image or intentions. This passage reflects the subtle ways in which Dostoevsky's narrative challenges and undermines the characters' social statuses and personal delusions, suggesting that buffoonery can be as much a matter of perception and interaction as it is a result of one's own folly. In The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky introduces readers to a profound emotional and psychological concept known as nadriv, which Robert Belknap meticulously examines in his analysis. This term, defying simple translation, encapsulates a spectrum of intense emotional experiences, from heartbreak and laceration to exacerbation and anguish. It's a concept that transcends mere emotional distress, embodying a complex interplay of self-inflicted pain, existential turmoil and paradoxical responses to both suffering and gratitude. The essence of Nadriv is vividly illustrated through characters like Ivan, Katerina Ivanovna and Lisa, who, unlike the buffoons of the narrative, such as Fyodor and Maximov, navigate their existential crises with a depth that verges on self-destruction. For instance, Katerina Ivanovna's tumultuous relationship with Mitya driven by a perverse blend of gratitude, love and self-torture, exemplifies Nadriv in its rawest form, her emotional torment rooted in the complex dynamics of her affections and obligations, mirrors the broader thematic exploration of human suffering and the search for meaning amidst chaos. Similarly, the tragic figure of Snagiryov, caught in the web of his own emotional upheaval, illustrates Nadriv through his hysterical refusal of Alyosha's well-intentioned financial aid. This scene not only highlights the character's pride and dignity, but also reveals the paradoxical nature of Nadriv, where gestures of kindness can become sources of profound psychological pain. Belknap's analysis sheds light on the duality of Nadriv as both a response to external benevolence and an internal masochistic desire to inflict emotional wounds on oneself and others. This duality is a stark contrast to the motif of buffoonery, which, while also engaging with themes of self-perception and societal rejection, often veers into the realm of absurdity and self-degradation. 
Where buffoonery might seek to elicit laughter or ridicule, Nardriv dwells in the realm of tears, highlighting a profound existential despair that resonates deeply with existentialist themes. The exploration of Nardriv in The Brothers Karamazov reveals Dostoevsky's intricate understanding of the human psyche, grappling with the extremes of emotional experience. It's an exploration that moves beyond the superficial layers of human suffering to touch upon the very essence of what it means to feel, to hurt, and to seek redemption in an indifferent world. In the context of Nadriv, a profound emotional and psychological concept defined by an intense spectrum of emotional experiences, Lisa presents an intriguing study through her complex interactions with Alyosha. This excerpt from their dialogue captures the essence of Nadriv vividly in Book 4, Chapter 4, at the Koklakovs. When he had finished, Lise threw up her hands in despair. But how? How can you have got yourself involved with those boys, especially wearing that garb of yours? She said indignantly, as if she had the right to tell him off. You're no better than a brat yourself. Indeed, you're as bad as the youngest of those urchins. But be sure to find out all about that horrible child and then tell me because I'm sure there must be some mystery there. Now, for the other thing, but before we go into it, I want you to tell me this. Can you, despite your pain, talk about something that's quite unimportant, yet still talk sensibly about it? This passage encapsulates the Nadriv within Lys not through self-inflicted pain or existential turmoil, but rather through her desperate yearning for meaningful interaction amidst her physical and emotional isolation. Lisa's Nadriv is embodied in her paradoxical actions, her demanding tone and imperious nature masking a deep vulnerability and a craving for connection. This demonstrates how Nadriv transcends mere emotional distress to encompass a broader spectrum of self-conflict, yearning, and the human condition's intrinsic contradictions. In The Brothers Karamazov, Fyodor Dostoevsky presents a profound exploration of divine grace, which Robert Belknap illuminates with keen insight. This exploration is deeply interwoven with the narrative's fabric, manifesting through the lives and experiences of characters such as Alyosha, Zosima, and Zosima's brother Markel. Grace, as depicted in the novel, is not merely a theological concept, but a palpable transformative force that shapes the destinies of those it touches. One of the most poignant representations of grace is found in Alyosha's memory of his mother praying before an icon, illuminated by the slanting rays of the setting sun. This image, seared into Alyosha's consciousness, symbolizes the transcendent nature of grace, linking the divine with the earthly, the eternal with the fleeting moments of human existence. The sun's slanting rays, a recurring motif, serve as a metaphor for divine grace itself, penetrating, illuminating, and warming the soul, guiding it towards a higher purpose. Zosima, as a vessel of grace, extends this divine light through his teachings and his very being. His reflections on his brother Markel's interaction with the natural world, addressing the birds in a moment of ecstatic realization of interconnectedness, highlight grace as a realization of unity and love that transcends individual existence. Markel's transformation, from a self-centered to a God-centered consciousness, underscores Grace's power to evoke a profound response of love and compassion towards all creation. The concept of Grace in the Brothers Karamazov is thus multidimensional, encapsulating the agony and ecstasy of human striving towards the divine. It acknowledges the profound ruptures, nadriv, that can occur in the soul, yet offers a vision of healing and redemption through the mutual recognition of our shared humanity and our longing for the divine. Through characters like Alyosha and Zosima, Dostoevsky reveals how grace can transform suffering into a source of strength, guiding individuals towards acts of selfless love and compassion that ripple outwards touching the lives of others in profound and unexpected ways. Belknap's analysis highlights how Dostoevsky employs grace not as a mere backdrop, but as a vital dynamic force within the narrative, one that challenges and transforms each character it touches. Through the slanting rays of the sun, the quiet moments of prayer, and the shared experiences of love and loss. 
grace emerges as a beacon of hope, offering a path towards reconciliation, redemption, and ultimately, a deeper understanding of the divine mystery that envelops all existence. In exploring the concept of divine grace in The Brothers Karamazov, a significant instance of spiritual transformation is vividly captured in the character of Grushenka. This moment of profound change is detailed in Book 11, Chapter 1, at Grushenka's. There were signs of a spiritual transformation in her. An unshakable determination filled her with both resignation and peace of mind. A little vertical line had appeared between her eyebrows which gave her beautiful face a look of thoughtful concentration and at first glance made it appear almost austere. In any case, there was nothing left now of her former frivolity. Alyosha found it somewhat strange, though, that despite the terrible blow she had suffered when the man she had promised to marry was arrested for a heinous crime almost at the very moment of their betrothal, despite her ensuing sickness and the almost inevitable guilty verdict at the forthcoming trial, Grushenka had never lost her youthful gaiety. Her eyes, once so proud, now shone with a quiet glow, although at times the old, hard and hostile fire still flickered in them. This excerpt showcases Grushenka's journey through a significant emotional and spiritual catharsis, deeply embodying the essence of divine grace. Her transformation, marked by a newfound depth of character and resilience, illustrates the nuanced depiction of divine grace as not merely a theological abstraction, but as a tangible, transformative force. Through Grushenka's experience, Dostoevsky conveys the multifaceted nature of divine grace, how it can emerge in moments of profound despair, offering solace and a pathway towards personal redemption. In The Brothers Karamazov, Fyodor Dostoevsky weaves a rich tapestry of characters and philosophical explorations that delve into human spirituality and existential angst. Through the detailed analysis presented by Belknap, we gain insight into the novel's complex interplay of inherent relationships, which profoundly impact readers' experience of the story. The narrative positions characters within both Christian and existentialist hierarchies, revealing deep spiritual and moral dilemmas. Dynamic and evolving, the relationships among characters like the buffoonish Fyodor and Maximov and the spiritually radiant Alyosha illustrate the spectrum of human folly and transcendence. Their stories, filled with absurdity and comic tragedy, alongside motifs of laughter that intertwine sacred and profane themes, challenge readers to find deeper meanings amid life's contradictions. Alyosha's childhood memory, highlighted by slanting sunlight, symbolizes divine grace that contrasts with the darker aspects of human existence. This recurring imagery of light against other characters emphasizes moments of spiritual clarity and unity, urging readers to reflect on grace and redemption in their lives. Belknap's analysis demonstrates how Dostoevsky's narrative strategy using motifs and character dynamics not only connects different elements of the story, but also focuses readers' attention on its central themes. The novel emerges as a profound inquiry into faith, doubt, and the search for meaning, transcending its fictional confines to engage with the universal human condition. The Brothers Karamazov stands as a monumental exploration of philosophical and theological questions, inviting readers to ponder their own existential journeys through the lens of its characters' experiences with Nadriv, divine grace, and moral questioning. Dostoevsky's work is not just a novel, but a deep meditation on life's eternal struggles and the pursuit of meaning in an enigmatic world. In the narrative arc of The Brothers Karamazov, a moment of profound collective awakening and moral insight that shapes our experience is poignantly depicted during Ilyusha's funeral in the epilogue. You know, boys, Alyosha said, you needn't be afraid of life. Life is so good when you do something that is good and just. Yes, yes, right some of the boys cried enthusiastically. We like you, Karamazov, cried a voice that could very well have been Kartashov's. We all like you, love you, all the boys joined in, and tears glistened in their eyes. 
Three cheers for Karamazov, Kolya shouted solemnly. May the memory of the dead boy live forever, Alyosha said. May it live forever, the boys echoed. This poignant scene captures a turning point for Kolya and the other boys, showcasing a transformative experience that underscores the theme of grace as a profound, life-affirming force. Through Alyosha's words, a space is created for reflection, mourning, and ultimately, a communal resolve to embrace life with courage, compassion, and a commitment to justice and goodness. The gathering around the stone becomes a symbol of unity and hope, marking a departure from grief towards a collective aspiration for a life led by moral principles. The episode at Ilyusha's funeral, while centered on a specific instance of mourning, reaches into the depths of Dostoevsky's thematic exploration of human existence, morality, and the potential for redemption. It exemplifies how grace, as conceptualized in the novel, acts as a catalyst for personal and communal transformation, guiding characters, and through them, readers, towards a deeper engagement with the ethical dimensions of life. <laughs>